So our next speaker is uh, is Adam Merberg. Adam is a senior staff learning staff machine learning engineer at Equilibrium Energy. Uh, he's been with them for about two years now, and Equilibrium is combining deep energy expertise with cutting edge technology to build a better power company. Very different from insurance that we just heard about. Um, previously, Adam has worked at companies like Helm AI, Hospital IQ. Um, etc. Focusing on data science and data engineering workloads. Adam has a PhD in mathematics from University of California at Berkeley. Adam, welcome to Metaflow Office Arts once again, and over to you. All right. Um, so I'll start by thanking Shri for the invitation to speak today, and, and also thanks to everyone at Outer Bounds and, and other companies for their work on this great project. Um, oh, and I have to share my screen. Glad I didn't get to the end of my presentation before I figured that out. Um, okay, I think that works. Okay, so yes, as she says, I, I work for a company called Equilibrium Energy and I'll, I'll talk about uh, Metaflow in our science platform. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about what we do at Equilibrium Energy. Uh, Equilibrium is a relatively new company. It's less than three years old, we're about a hundred, a little less than 100 people now. Um, we are very broadly in the, the climate tech space. Um, so as in order to counter climate change, one of the things that we need to do as a society is to electrify everything. Um, and that uh, requires various enhancements to the electric grid. We also, not only in terms of adding storage and, and transmission, but um, also, of course, uh, more renewables. Um, but um, at, at a very high level, the incumbent power companies aren't leading us in the right direction and, and certainly not fast enough. Um, and so we're building a, a power company um, to fill that void. Um, so so that's the, the very high level. So what we um, uh, uh, to, to get a little further into the weeds, uh, currently we're operating a grid scale battery in Texas. Um, this is, it's a very large battery, 100 megawatt hours. Um, we expect to be scaling up in the very near future with more batteries. We also do something called virtuals trading. Uh, which is basically financial trades in energy markets that don't have an underlying physical asset. Um, and so we use machine learning and power system science and optimization to understand power markets and, and participate in those markets. So when I joined the company almost two years ago, um, we were orchestrating our production machine learning pipelines with Kubeflow on Argo workflows. Um, and then on the experimentation side, people were using a variety of ad hoc solutions. Uh, there were some scripts on EC2 instances. There was this tool called Plumber, which is, uh, it's, I, I never used it myself. Uh, my understanding is it's, it's something for like turning a, a Jupyter notebook into a pipeline. Um, and one of the things things that was very difficult about this setup was that we were using mostly different code for experimentation and production. Um, so that meant when the data science uh, scientists had a model that, uh, you know, they, or even just a change to a model that uh, they wanted to send into production, well, there was this painful re-implementation process. And then the often even more painful process of reconciling the, the production and the experimentation version. So late last year, we began evaluating orche alternative orchestration tools. Uh, we wanted something that uh, would make it easy for us to run the same code locally and in the cloud at scale. Uh, you know, we also wanted, um, to be able to run DAG-based pipelines, to parameterize pipelines, and, and to track and visualize our pipelines. And so there are quite a few tools out there for machine learning orchestration. Uh, we looked at a lot of them. 
Um, and uh, Metaflow really stood out to us. Um, it, it really checked all of our boxes, um, you know, as, especially being able to run the same code locally and in the cloud at scale. Um, there were a number that, that came close, but actually didn't have good support for Apple Silicon. So um, that, that was something of a differentiator. Um, and um, aside from the things that we were looking for, we also found a, that, uh, you know, we really liked that Metaflow had support for Argo workflows. Um, we were already using Argo workflows. And so it was kind of one less new thing that we would have to learn on the infrastructure side. Um, also the project management functionality. So being able to tag project, mm -hmm. Uh, tag flows and and the project decorator, um, the namespacing, to um, and oops, yeah. and and um, a, a nice little bonus was the the resume command. I think um, we've saved a lot of time by being able to resume a failed run with whatever changes uh, we thought might fix the bug. Um, so, yeah, so we went live with Metaflow earlier this year. Um, our first use case was forecasting for battery operations. Um, that's our really our main and most mature use case at this point, but it is not the only one. Um, so uh, we use it for both experimentation and production, um, and we're able to use basically the same modeling code um generally speaking we use argo workflows for cloud orchestration um and uh we schedule cron workflows uh we use cron workflows for uh production runs that need to be scheduled uh yeah so in the as i said in the production side we use argo workflows with um the cron scheduling. We have various internal extensions uh, to do things that we need to do. So our error handling, uh, we use some custom decorators for that. Um, so that deals with things like notifications, creating incidents. Um, we have another decorator for some environment setup, and we have some custom cards to, to visualize the artifacts that come out of our training and, and inference runs. Um, now, our model deployment process, oops, keep uh, putting my finger on my mouse wheel there, and uh, our model deployment process is um, actually a, a human in the loop process, so it's not fully automated. Uh, we have an internal CLI uh, that helps out with that. Um, one thing that we've recently deployed um, that um, takes advantage of some newer Metaflow functionality is uh, the Argo uh, using the Argo events integration. When we finish training uh, a new uh, model, we have a second flow that's triggered to automatically generate a comparison of the newly triggered tr the newly trained model um, against the one that is currently deployed. Um, and so that's that summary is something that. The human in the loop will use um, to um, decide whether the model is indeed ready for deployment. Um, on the experimental side, um, the data scientists can really do whatever sort of orchestration they want. Uh, you know, they can run it. They can run their experiments locally. They can use Kubernetes. Um, they can use Argo workflows. Uh, we don't have any real restrictions on that. I guess we don't support AWS batch just because that's not something uh, we use within the organization. Um, I think most people prefer Argo workflows because um, it's nice not having to worry about, you know, well, what happens if I close my laptop? Um, but um, sometimes it can be easier just to do things um, locally if they're not going to run that long. Um, so 
one thing we use quite heavily on the experimentation side is the the uh, branching the parallelization with uh, metaflows for each um, and we have some custom decorators that we use internally uh, for including local changes in cloud workflows. Um, that's something that's made a pretty big difference in, I think, speed of iteration uh, because we don't have to wait for a Docker image to build before we can uh, try running um, our, our changes in, um, in the cluster. So that's kind of where things are now. Um, I'll say a little bit about where we're, where we go from here. What what are we working on? Um, so we're looking at um, a broader adoption of Argo events. Um, so one example of how we might you do that is. Uh, just increasing the modularity of our pipelines. So taking one pipeline and breaking it into a couple of pipelines with, where um, you have a second pipeline that's triggered on completion of the first pipeline. Um, we're looking at also some doing some GitOps deployment uh, for our model and models and pipelines with Argo CD. We're actually already using Argo CD on the infrastructure side, um, but not so much on the, the model and pipeline deployment side. Um, and finally, there are a number of additional use cases that uh, we're looking at supporting. So I, I think broadly, you know, our organization is, is pretty happy with what we've done so far with Metaflow, and we're looking at, um, uh, we have something of a push for broader adoption within the company. Um, so people are starting to use Metaflow on the, the virtuals trading side. Um, there it's helping to replace some kind of awkward manual processes where people are, uh, or were uh, provisioning EC2 instances manually and then uh, running, running scripts. Um, uh, another use case, which is kind of interesting, um, there's some optimization work that actually runs, um, uh, that actually is written in Julia, um, and they're not really doing anything, uh, to, there's not really any magic to, to making Julia work. It's, they're just running Julia in a sub process. And so, um, Artifact tracking is, is not the simplest on, on that side, um, but I think they are already seeing some benefits um, in the few weeks since they, they've gone live with the, uh, the Metaflow into, uh, the Metaflow support there. Um, and so one nice thing about um, having that in, uh, in, in Metaflow is that it will make it easier for us to integrate the machine learning work with the optimization, um, for instance, by triggering um, with Argo events. And we also have some, some early stage efforts to get some of the power system science work on Metaflow as well. Um, but um, that is, I would say, early enough in development that I, I don't, there's not a lot to say about it yet. So, yeah, that's all I have. I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. This is so cool. This is so cool, and especially like the Julia part. This is the first time I'm hearing of people actually using Julia as part of Metaflow, which is really, really cool. Um, what One quick question. I mentioned you uh, you uh, used the term EC2 instances multiple times. So is it fair mm -hmm. to say that uh, all of this infrastructure currently runs on AWS? Yes, we're we're all on AWS. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions, folks? Like, feel free to just jump in. Uh, you can ask your questions here. If you know, forward. If for some reason you need to type the message into chat, feel free to do it. I'll make sure that it gets relayed here, and we can have a conversation about it. Um, I'm also very curious about the Julia piece, and kind of, I would love to hear your thoughts on, like, if you zoom out and sort of have a wish list or 
what, what would you imagine to be the ideal way of connecting optimization routines in Julia to Metaflow artifacts or even other Metaflow features beyond mm -hmm. what you mentioned already? Um, is there kind of like a, a clear path in your mind for like what, what, what a good integration would look like? Or is that still up in the air? Mm. Yeah, so I have to admit, I wasn't I wasn't all that involved in that work myself. Um, I talked to James, who is the um, engineer who worked on that. Um, I think one thing one thing he did mention was um, even on the Python side, um, he found it kind of awkward to have to have um, to actually have to have all of your artifacts in memory. Um, like I, you could imagine a system where maybe a, um, an artifact could be a path to a local file, right? And, um, and something like that would, I think, integrate better with, um, with, uh, you know, other languages that, you know, weren't directly supported uh, by Metaflow. So, Interesting. And then uh, just to kind of look at the scale of this. Um, I don't actually know how many nodes we have. Uh, I had seen earlier one of our infrastructure people maybe is, is on. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if he's still here, uh, but, um, yeah. That, that, that's, that's, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, I was just curious, like, you know, especially given that, <clears throat> When you mentioned my, people quite often run uh, Argo workflows, even kind of sort of for like as part of development, they probably just mm -hmm. trigger a workflow so that you know mm -hmm. you can drop mm -hmm. your laptop and not worry about it. So does that kind of sort of increase the number of nodes you need to have? Um, mm -hmm. And and then what's kind of sort of the developer experience like? Mm -hmm. Because you know you submit a flow and then you know Argo might take a little more time than. Running interactively, is that okay? Um, you know, do people just wait for the flow to quickly start and then you know look at the Argo UI for what are logs and results and stuff like that? Yeah, I think people are are mostly okay with that waiting. I mean, we've had some issues actually, even just with our Docker image uh, uh -huh. having uh, yeah taking a while to load onto onto the nodes, um, okay. but um, I think, uh, not, not to say that there hasn't been any pain, and we have more recently kind of run into this problem of, of uh, coming, <laughs> coming near our, our resource quotas. Um, so I think that that's something we're having to figure out on the infrastructure side. Um, but um, we actually don't necessarily have a ton of, of uh, production um, job, uh, pipelines yet. Um, mm -hmm. And so if things take a little bit longer, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, if, if something in production fails, then, then that's... Uh, yeah. A different scale of headache than you know someone's experiment being a little bit slow. Uh, 